so much for coming to tonight's panel entitled Militarization, Domestic Spying, and the Boycott of Israel. Uh, the panel tonight is being hosted by New Yorkers against the Cor Cornell Technion Partnership, more about which later. Uh, we are very pleased to see you all here to have such a nice turnout. Uh, and uh, we have an excellent lineup of panelists for you, and uh, I will be introducing each of them in due course. Uh, before we begin, I want to uh, thank a number of people and places. First of all, Melissa Jamison and Judson Memorial Church for providing space for our event this evening. I'd like to thank Deep Dish TV for videographer services, and for those of you who don't recognize her, our videographer this evening is Fida Kishta, uh, who is a director. Some of you know that uh, Fida Kishta is the director of the film Where Should the Birds Fly, which is distributed by Deep Dish TV. Maybe some of you have seen the film. Um, so thank you, Fida, for your services this evening. Uh, I'd also like to thank a number of panel endorsers. We have a, a, a huge list of them, and I'd like to read them to you. These are, these are groups that uh, have shown their support for this panel. Uh, Adala New York, the New York Campaign for the Boycott of Israel. Architects and Planners for Justice in Palestine. The British Committee for the Universities of Palestine. Der Yassin Remembered. Desi's Rising Up and Moving, or Drum. Faculty for Palestine, Jews Say No, New York City War Resisters League, Students for Justice in Palestine at Brooklyn College, City College CUNY, College of Staten Island, Cornell University, and the CUNY Law School, as well as John Jay College and Rutgers University Newark, all Students for Justice in Palestine groups. Also United National Anti-War Coalition, U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, Queers Against Israeli Apartheid, and the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. Thanks to all of those groups for their support for this event. And thanks to our, our four panelists uh, for being here this evening. Thank you to David Swanson, to Fahad Ahmed, to Reham Barghouti, and to Anna Kelcutt. Um, so each of our panelists is going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will open the floor to Q&A. Now, before we begin, I, I want to explain to you that this panel was conceived uh, in the context of nearly two years of organizing by NIACT, uh, New Yorkers Against the Cornell Part uh, Technion Partnership, um, against that partnership. And the theme of the panel, I think, is best summed up by the following quote, which I'm going to read uh, to you from uh, uh, an essay that was published in Audre Lynn's The Case for Sanctions Against Israel. It's an essay written by professors David Lloyd and Laura Polito, and it's called In the Long Shadow of the Settler on Israeli and U.S. Colonialism. And it goes like this. Israel as a bastion of Western civilization in the non-Western world has become a laboratory for repression and for military and carceral forms of population control and discipline, much as Northern Ireland and South Africa were in the 1970s and 80s. The siege mentality of settler colonies positions them ideally to serve as experimental zones for counterinsurgency technologies and the control of subjugated and migrant populations. Consequently, Israel has become a vital resource in the global war on terror a moniker that signifies the curtailment of human and civil rights and the refunctioning of colonial racial states. Israel has become the essential partner in the counterterrorism industry, an international academic industrial complex whose positivistic lack of critical thinking would be breathtaking were it not so opportunistically self-serving. The collaboration of U.S. politicians, for example, example, Mayor Bloomberg, with Israel's propaganda and security apparatuses signals not only the alliance of the U.S. with Israel's colonial project, but the far more insidious normalization of the security state and its technologies and methods that Israel is pioneering and that constitute an essential element of the repressive knowledge economy that involves the increasingly sinister <coughs> collaboration of universities, the military, 
and private security corporations in a tight loop of economic self-interest. So without further ado, let me begin by introducing our first speaker, David Swanson, whose books include War No More, The Case for Abolition, The Military Industrial Complex at 50, and When the World Outlawed War. He is the host of Talk Nation Radio and campaign coordinator for Roots Action, an online initiative de dedicated to galvanizing Americans committed to economic fairness, equal rights, civil liberties, environmental protection, and defunding endless wars. He also works on the Communications Committee of Veterans for Peace, of which he is an associate non-veteran member, and is secretary of peace in the Green Shadow Cabinet, a civic project which provides an ongoing opposition and alternative voice to the dysfunctional government in Washington, D.C. David Swanson. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for setting this up. It's great to be here. I think maybe all of those endorsers should have waited to hear what we were going to say first before they endorsed us, but hopefully they won't be sorry. Um, I, I wrote down some remarks. I'll try to fit them into 20 minutes. Um, so it, the primary problem, I think, with weaponized drones is that the weapons murder people, and they murder people in a way that looks more like murder to a lot of observers than other forms of military murder do, such as murder by indiscriminate bombing or artillery or infantry or dropping white phosphorus on people. When President Obama looks through a list of men, women, and children on a Tuesday terror meeting and picks which ones to murder and has them murdered, and you, you can call it war or not call it war, it begins to look to a lot of people like murder. Many of the victims are civilians. Many are men suspected of or just of the age for combat. And in fact, the policy has been to define military-aged males as combatants. And other victims are alleged to be serious criminals. Not indicted, not charged, not tried or convicted, just alleged. And they're blown up along with anybody too nearby. It begins to look like the killing spree of a disgruntled employee at a shopping mall. But there's a key difference. It's happening in a foreign place with people who don't look like us or talk like us. I've been asked more than once, aren't drones preferable to piloted planes or ground troops since with drones nobody gets killed? <laughs> this is what drones do to foreign policy. They create deceptively easy and deceptively cost-free solutions. The drone war on Yemen didn't replace some other kind of war that was worse. It added another war to the list. Here is the real danger. We're making murder in its most recognizable form acceptable, and we're defining it out of existence when the victims belong to that 96% of humanity that's never been considered quite all the way human in this country, which leaves only the slightest step to including certain traitorous Americans as well. President Obama jokes about sending drones after his daughter's boyfriends, and the press corps laughs. Former NSA and CIA director Michael Hayden jokes about putting Edward Snowden on the kill list and everybody laughs. If we can be at war with individual criminals, why not add whistleblowers to the list? They reveal the powerful secrets that give our high priests their prestige. They reveal crimes and abuses that outrage us, but outrage foreign nations too. They open a door through which we can begin to question what the distinction really is between joking about murder by million dollar missile and joking about murder with an ax, such that we admire one and are horrified by the other. The fact is that the most realistic mass murder costumes you will see at the Halloween parade will be on men and women who've wandered up from Wall Street in their stylish suits. The drone industry seems quite pleased with our acceptance of their technology for murder, but frustrated that some of us are resistant in our own backward, superstitious way, to favoring the use of killer drones that are fully automated. That is, we've accepted drones as good, moral killing devices when a human is at a desk to pull the trigger. But we find something vaguely disturbing about the drone pulling the trigger itself. Michael Toscano, president and CEO of the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, says, quote, Right now, in human nature, it's unacceptable for a machine to kill a human being. 
but he is confident that that will change as we begin to wise up and see the advantages. In fact, there are those who would like to ban automated drones and automated killing robots of all types, and I agree with them exactly as far as they go. Any weapon we can ban, let's ban it. But let's not in the process make non-automated drone murder acceptable. If you listen to the accounts of some former drone pilots, so-called pilots who dress up in pilot suits and sit at a desk to fly drones, the, the, you know, and, who, and who drive past a sign on the way home every day that says, buckle up, this is the most dangerous part of your day. If, if you listen to these people, there is not significantly more moral consideration going into the human pulling of the trigger than there would be with the drone pulling the trigger. The majority of volunteers in experiments are willing to inflict extreme pain or death on other human beings when a scientist tells them to do so for the good of science. These are called Milgram experiments and the pain or death is pretended by actors. Drone pilots do real Milgram experiments where the deaths are real, the injuries are real, the suffering is real. Drones do not, of course, just kill. They traumatize children and adults. The buzzing overhead, threatening imminent death for weeks on end, is a severe form of cruelty, an extreme case of power over others at an extreme distance, and exactly as indiscriminate as poison gas. Mothers in Yemen teach neighbors' kids in their homes for fear of letting them go to school. In Gaza, people refer to Israel's drones with a word that means buzz, but can also mean a relentlessly nagging wife. In Living Under Drones, the report produced here at NYU and at Stanford, I, I think that report made a lot of people aware of what drones do to Pakistan, whose prime minister today told our president it had to stop. Whole societies are devastated by the ongoing threat and the sporadic murders. Israel has killed hundreds in Gaza with drones, but the drone pilot sits at his desk and follows the instructions of his authority figure. On June 6th, NBC News interviewed a former drone pilot named Brandon Bryant, who was deeply depressed over his role in killing over 1,600 people. He described watching his victims bleed to death and wondering what, if anything, they were guilty of. It became clear why drone pilots suffer PTSD at higher rates than real pilots. They see everything, including the children they kill. Quote, after participating in hundreds of missions over the years, Bryant said he lost respect for life and began to feel like a sociopath. When he told a woman he was seeing that he'd been a drone operator and contributed to the deaths of a large number of people, she cut him off. Quote, she looked at me like I was a monster, he said, and she never wanted to touch me again. Somehow members of the United States Congress, where drones have their own caucus to represent them, seem less turned off, if not in fact aroused. But what about the rest of us? Where do we come down? A majority in the U.S., a shrinking majority, but still, as far as I know, a majority favors using drones to kill non-Americans outside of the United States. Pew surveyed 39 countries this past summer and found three that supported this policy. Any guesses? Israel. 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 United States. The United States. Kenya. The United States, Kenya, and Israel. Kenya. I don't know. <laughs> and within the United States, there's not a big partisan divide. There is much more concern, however, about killing U.S. citizens or killing anyone within the United States, but less if they're immigrants on the border, less in hostage situations, etc. The first place the wars will come home is in our minds. The U.S. Congress recently gave the Capitol Police the longest standing ovation since Osama bin Laden's Muslim sea burial for what quickly turned out to be the shooting of an unarmed mother trying to get away. Oh my God. Congress members are in the habit of cheering for senseless murder abroad in the form of wars. Drone victims are labeled militants after the fact by virtue of being dead. Transfer those habits to the streets of Capitol Hill and it's easy enough to imagine that a dead woman deserved to die after all, she's dead. Our police are beginning to look like the military and the public like the enemy. Murderers are cheered if they wear uniforms. Bloomberg claims absurdly to have the seventh largest army in the world. 
and small town police departments with nothing worse than drunk driving to confront them are stocking up on weaponry including weaponized drones, weaponized with tear gas, rubber bullets, and other anti-personnel device. In Montgomery County, Texas, the sheriff showed off a drone to the media but crashed it into his armored vehicle, thereby proving that he needed the armored vehicle. Also in Texas, when the Department of Homeland Security challenged the University of Texas Austin to hack into a drone and take control of it, the response was no problem and it was quickly done. Is this a part of U.S. wars people are really going to sit back and watch come home? Many of the drones going into the U.S. skies will be for surveillance. A drone can sit too high up in the sky to see it from the ground but record everything on the ground for hours and hours on video. A drone as small as a bird or a bug can listen to you and your cell phone inside your home. Drones can threaten and intimidate potential protesters as well as racially and religiously profiled groups with surveillance and with weaponry. The NSA has been a big part of the Kill List program, the same NSA that tracks all of us in the land of the free. A Congressional Research Service report arrived at the obvious conclusion that drones are incompatible with the Fourth Amendment. I would add the First Amendment, and I would add representative government. So the fact that the technology is exciting, or that drones can perform lots of useful and harmless functions is all well and good, but figure out how they're compatible with constitutional rights first, and then allow them in those ways if possible. And if it isn't, then instead of using drones to fight forest fires, let's focus on halting climate change. If we've survived this long without getting our coffee delivered by drone, I think we can make it a little farther. It's not the technology's fault, we're told, by those more offended at insults to technology than by assaults on humans. Drones carrying Hellfire missiles over houses on the other side of the world don't kill people. People kill people. But as it happens, drones don't hunt deer. Drones don't protect grandma. The Second Amendment right to an 18th century musket when you're taking part in a state militia does not create a right to killer flying robots. This is a new technology that needs to be dealt with as such. It is a technology of legalized murder. It's always struck me as odd that in civilized, Geneva Conventionized, Samantha Powerized war, the only crime that gets legalized is murder. Not torture, not assault, or rape, or theft, or marijuana, or cheating on your taxes, or parking in a handicapped spot. Just murder. But will somebody please explain to me why homicide, bomb, homicide bombing is not as bad as suicide bombing? It isn't strictly true, after all, that the damage is all on one side. We just, we, as we learn the geography of the world by our wars, we learn the location of our drone bases by the blowback as we just did in Yemen, as we did a couple years back in Afghanistan. Drones make us all less safe. As Malala just pointed out to the Obama family, the drone wars fuel terrorism. Drones also kill with friendly fire. Drones with or without weapons crash a lot. And drones make the initiation of violence easier, more secretive, and more concentrated. When sending missiles into Syria was made a big public question, we overwhelmed the Congress, which said no. But missiles are sent into other countries all the time from drones, and we're not asked. The UN, which has been looking at US, Israeli, and UK drone use, has just submitted a couple of reports on drones to the General Assembly ahead of a debate scheduled for Friday. The reports make some useful points. US drones have killed hundreds of civilians, Drones make war the norm rather than the exception. Signature strikes are illegal. Double tap strikes where you shoot at the rescuers of the previous strike are illegal. Killing rather than capturing is illegal. Imminence as a term to define a supposed threat cannot be redefined to mean eventual or just barely imaginable. Threatened by drones is the fundamental right to life. However, the UN reports are so subservient to Western lawyer groupthink as to allow that some drone kills are legal and to make the determination of which ones are legal and which are not so complex that nobody can possibly say the determination will be political rather than empirical. The UN wants transparency, and I do think that is a stronger demand than asking for the so-called legal memos that Obama has hidden in a drawer which supposedly make the drone kills legal. 
We do not need to see that lawyerly contortionism. Do you remember Obama's speech back in May at which he claimed that only four of his victims had been Americans, and for one of them, he had invented criteria for himself to follow? even though all available evidence suggested he did not, even in that case. And he promised to apply those same criteria to foreigners going forward, maybe in some countries, depending. And remember the liberal applause for that. Never, ever do I recall our demands of President Bush being that he give a speech. There was always something more demanded. And how happy people were this past week when instead of blowing somebody up with a drone, Obama kidnapped them and interrogated them in secret on a ship in the ocean. We don't need the memos. We need the videos. The times, places, names, justifications, casualties, and the video footage of each murder. That is, if the UN is going to give its stamp of approval to a new kind of war, but ask for a token of gratitude, that is what it should be. It might slow down the march of the drones, which is in fact being led by the United States and Israel. Israel developed drones in the 1970s. Medea Benjamin's book on drones begins with the story of how an Israeli engineer who had worked for an Israeli military contractor developed the prototype of the Predator drone in his garage in Southern California in the 1980s with funding from DARPA and the CIA. And the first thing he came up with was called the Albatross, which is not a bad name, really. Israel is the world's top exporter of drones, not the United States. Technion is a leading developer of drone technology, including drones that can fly 1,850 miles without refueling and carry two 1,100-pound bombs, as well as miniature surveillance drones, bulldozers, and other weapons of fairly massive destruction used in illegally occupied lands, where Israel has used chemical and all other sorts of weapons while continuing to receive billions of dollars every year of what we in the US Orwellianly call military aid. So creating a drone island in the East River no doubt appeals to those in the Israeli government who spy on the US and those in the US who spy on Israel, but especially to those who want to legitimize and Americanize the US image of Israel's militarism, to make it as unquestionable in the US as US militarism sometimes is. The US media questions the cost of feeding the hungry while treating militarism as a jobs program even though programs to feed the hungry would more efficiently produce jobs. The federal government's trillion dollars a year for wars and war preparations doesn't count contributions from state and local governments and universities. The plans of Cornell and Technion to advance the technology of death on Roosevelt Island were apparently approved because of money involved and in the process a hospital will be destroyed. That is a typical trade-off. For a fraction of what we spend on weaponry, we could provide food, water, medicine to the world. Many, many more people are killed through what we do not do with our money than through what we do with it in wars. Of course, we could also choose to invest in education <coughs> instead of in militarism. It is no coincidence that the nation that spends a trillion dollars every year on militarism has a trillion dollars in student debt and no coincidence that universities corrupted by military contracts are holding forums promoting war in Syria. An early supporter of Technion who would be outraged by its current practices is a guy named Albert Einstein who said, quote, you cannot simultaneously prevent and prepare for war. And he was right. You have to choose one or the other. A lot of people right now are doing so. In September, the University of Edinburgh responded to student protests and withdrew its investment from Ultra Electronics, a company that produces the navigation controls for US killer drones. Here in New York, the Granny Peace Brigade and No Drones and the World Can't Wait and lots of other great groups have been pressuring the UN and the City Council and Congress and drone manufacturers and educating the public. The Center for Constitutional Rights is doing the legal work against drone murder, and it just may be that lawsuits turn out to be a major tool in stopping the drones. An organization I work for called Roots Action has set up a petition at banweaponizeddrones.org that right now has 99,000 signatures. I think we can bump it over 100,000 or maybe 200,000. So go to banweaponizeddrones.org. 
Uh, where I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, we passed the first city resolution against drones, weaponized or surveillance since when, <laughs> since when three more cities have passed them and eight states. But the state laws have dealt only with surveillance and they have not sought to limit the weaponization of domestic drones, including with non-lethal weaponry. Some of them have made exceptions to their surveillance restrictions for the U.S. military. Four cities is not a lot, and I think one reason why is the complexities of the surveillance issue. I think cities would more readily pass resolutions committing not to use weaponized drones, and I would love to see New York City asked to do that. Even a failure on that question would wake a lot of people up to a new danger in the skies. Drone bases around the country are facing endless protests, as I'm sure Drone Island in the East River will if created. If New Yorkers can chase David Petraeus away, I am sure they can chase Technion away. Nowhere has seen more or better nonviolent resistance to drones than Hancock Air Base in upstate New York. But people have been risking and serving serious jail sentences to call attention and build resistance to these operations all over the country, including in Niagara Falls this past weekend, where activists are advancing a plan to turn the military airport into an array of solar panels that would power half of this state. This November, like this past April, will be a time of drone protests everywhere and of Code Pink's drone summit in Washington, D.C., which everyone should try to get to. Next Tuesday, Congressman Grayson will hear testimony from two kids injured in Pakistan by drones, although the State Department won't let their lawyer come. And yesterday, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch released reports on drones full of great information, but still maintaining that some drone murders are legal and some aren't. They and the UN Special Rapporteur will be at, NY, at NYU Law School on Tuesday. And if you want to go to that, and you should, you have to RSVP at the Open Society Foundation's website. And on Wednesday, Brave New Films will release its film on drone killing. As we take on the drones, I think we should bear a few key points in mind. Foreign lives are not worth less than local ones. Killing with one kind of weapon is not worse than killing with some other kind of weapon. Killing is evil and illegal, whether or not you call it part of a war. The killing is multiplied many fold by the spending of funds on it that could have been spent saving lives. A war is not a respectable activity marred by war crimes and atrocities. War is the crime. We shouldn't oppose waste at the Pentagon more fervently than we oppose efficiency at the Pentagon. If we can stop believing in just torture or humane rape or good slavery, we can stop believing in acceptable war. If the government of Israel makes war, we should employ every nonviolent tool to resist it, and the very same goes for the government of the United States of America. much, David, for that uh, very inspiring talk. Our next speaker is Fahad Ahmed, who is legal and policy director running the End Racial Profiling Campaign at Desi's Rising Up and Moving, a multi-generational, membership-led organization of low-wage South Asian immigrant workers and youth in New York City working to mobilize and build leadership towards social and policy change from immigrant rights to education reform, civil rights, and workers' justice. Mr. Ahmed came to the United States as an undocumented immigrant from Pakistan in 1991, and after facing deportation in 2000, he led drums work with Muslim, Arab, and South Asian immigrant detainees by coordinating its detainee visitation program. He has been involved with the Muslim community as an activist, and draws upon an understanding of Islamic theology that is committed to the ideals of social justice and to the spirit of liberation that lies at the center of Islam. Anytime we talk about uh, Israel and the uh, 
colonial settler state, uh, I'd like to start with the recognition that we ourselves here stand and sit on uh, indigenous lands that have been stolen from the original peoples over here, and that we live in a colonial settler state. Um, and I think uh, Brother David very uh, pointedly pointed out that uh, there's not a whole lot of difference in how issues of militarism are approached in Israel to how they are being approached in the U.S. And that both of these states sort of work hand in hand to continue to expand that, uh, that way of thinking and that way of operating. Uh, my name is Fahad Ahmed. I'm the legal director of DRUM. We are a organization of working class South Asians uh, organizing for justice. The issues were mentioned. Uh, and uh, we've been dealing with the issue of, uh, I'm going to be really be focusing on the surveillance of South Asians, Muslims, Arabs, uh, and activists in New York City and beyond. Um, particularly the NYPD, but as well as the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. Can folks hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll lay out sort of what the surveillance is and then sort of uh, we can start to make some of the links to how, how it relates to Israel in particular. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the surveillance in New York City has been ongoing essentially since 9-11. I mean some of it even predates 9-11, but particularly since 9-11. Uh, after 9-11 there was massive amounts of sweeps that took place in the communities here. Over 1,200 uh, mostly men, 99% men were rounded up. Uh, disappeared into the night, uh, held incommunicado from their families, from their lawyers, from their communities for anywhere from three weeks to six months. <coughs> they were housed at county jails in uh, New Jersey and slowly they were either released but the vast majority of them were deported. 1,200 men picked up. Uh, anybody want to take a venture on how many of them were found to have connections to terrorism? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one year after 9-11, the institution of the NSEERS program, also known as Special Registrations, asked men over the ages of 16 from 28 different countries, 27 of them Muslim majority countries, the 28th being North Korea to add some diversity. Uh, these men were asked to register with the government. Uh, 83,000 registered, 13,000 were put into deportation proceedings. Anybody want to take a venture at how many were found to have connections to terrorism? Zero. Zero. There's also the Absconder Initiative, which deported 5,000 people. Uh, there's uh, thousands of FBI interviews that took place, but you could say well over 100,000 people were processed and detained, interrogated, or deported by uh, U.S. Uh, law enforcement agencies, the NYPD, the FBI, immigration, and they found zero people to have connections. And when you do 100,000 or more people and produce zero results, it's really not very, it doesn't look very good. Uh, so partially to combat the backlash that they were getting from this, but partially also to find the real terrorists, uh, the surveillance agencies by 2002, uh, around August of 2002, really started doing, uh, going deeper into the communities. And actually the way that we encountered it was that they came to the communities and said, we're sorry we deported all these people, we rounded up all these people. What we want now is your help to find the right people. <laughs> and for DRUM as an organization that came out of uh, you know, longer struggles against police uh, misconduct, being mentored by a lot of folks that faced the state violence, uh, including a lot of Black Panthers, folks from the Young Lords Party, really sort of knew what this meant. This was a way to infiltrate the community and to expand their surveillance deep inside the community. And we urged our community not to participate in these efforts. But because so many people were afraid, a lot of them opened their doors and said, we have nothing to hide. You know, you can come talk to people. You can do whatever you need to do. And once that door is opened, you cannot close that door back. And immediately we started hearing reports of people saying, oh, you know, they're asking me to collect the license plate numbers of people that come to the mosque. They're asking me weird questions about, you know, who are the people that uh, I hang out with in the restaurant and what their political views are and who do they sympathize with back home and what affiliations they have and all these things. 
And uh, you know, we were dealing with these issues for well over 2002 till about two years ago. And two years ago, the Associated Press started putting out documents about the NYPD spying program. And what it did was really confirm what a lot of people in our communities had been saying, what our organization had been saying, that the NYPD, separately also the FBI, have been infiltrating the community. And what came out in the documents is that they're, they have a list of every single mosque in New York City. New York City Muslims for years have wondered how many mosques there are, you know, the community so big. Well, the NYPD provided us the answer. It's, it's somewhere close to 250, uh, at least of, you know, a few years ago when these documents are dated. Uh, but not only just mosques. They have lists of restaurants. They have lists of cab drivers. Uh, they have lists of places where people hang out. Uh, community centers, uh, community organizations. Uh, they tried getting lists of street vendors. Uh, they tried getting lists of places where people play sports, where they play cricket and play soccer. Uh, they have lists of student organizations, Muslim student organizations, Palestinian student organizations. Um, essentially, they have mapped and listed out every single aspect of New York City Muslims out of South Asians daily lives. Unless you are a person that only stays at home or unless you only like to go shopping and do nothing else. Which means capitalism itself is okay. You know, as long as you continue promoting that, you're all right. Um, and what's come out in the reports that the Associated Press put out is that this model is very much based on the surveillance model used in the West Bank mm. that Israel used to map out, to surveil, and to control the communities in the West Bank and to control resistance in the West Bank. <coughs> um, but uh, just to mention also, in the surveillance in New York City, we do find, uh, you know, we're a South Asian organization, we've been documenting people's experiences with law enforcement and our results clearly show that there is a elevated level of surveillance of the Palestinian community. And those that sympathize with the Palestinian struggle, and those that are engaged in Palestinian rights activism. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Not only is this model on the West Bank, the uh, NYPD also has a program that, uh, that they fund through the New York, New York Police Foundation, a private arm, uh, that gathers funds from private donors, uh, a lot of them who seem to have relationships with Israel. And through this private funding, the NYPD sends officers to be stationed abroad in Jerusalem, in Israel, in the UK, uh, in Sydney, in other major cities. And they say that this is to collect intelligence to figure out how attacks elsewhere are related to attacks here in New York City. And in one of the AP reports, uh, we find out that the officer stationed in Israel is getting requests from Israeli intelligence, essentially saying, can you please direct the NYPD intelligence division to go check out this person that lives in Bay Ridge, or this person that lives in Astoria, Queens, and interrogate them on this, or surveil them on that. And they comply with their requests. Imagine the New York Police Department is complying with the request for surveillance being put forward by the Israeli police and the Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military. And so, and so if they're actually complying with requests, you can, we can obviously see that there's information exchange going on as well. Um, and then another aspect of this is the targeting of activists. Um, the, in, after the uh, you know, reports were coming out about the NYPD surveillance program here, one of the reports that came out uh, listed DRUM's uh, organization. It also listed several other uh, organizations that do uh, police accountability work in New York City. Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, the Justice Committee, CAB Organizing Asian Communities. Uh, because we were involved in organizing against the NYPD's murder of Sean Bell, a African-American male that was gunned down uh, under a hail of 50 bullets in 2007 or 2008, I believe. I'm sorry? The protest was in 2006? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, and so not only are the organizations listed, but the NYPD spying on the family of Sean Bell. That is asking for justice, right? In that, and this is a document that just covers one week of activities. In that very same document, there's listing of Palestinian activists that are organizing. Uh, I believe Al Auda is listed. There's also some activists in New Orleans that are talking about linking different movements together. That includes Palestinian issues. So there's an NYPD undercover officer in New Orleans documenting what they're talking about. So what we really start to see is that uh, the interests of the Israeli intelligence and their efforts at social control are completely intertwined uh, with the US and particularly with the NYPD's efforts at social control and monitoring and surveillance. Now what purpose does all this surveillance serve? Uh, it, it continually renews the threat, the always impending imminent threat posed by Arabs, by Muslims, by South Asians, not only abroad but also here at home, which I think then serves a large purpose in justifying the use of drones, in justifying the use of the wars abroad, to say, look, this is the reason that we need to continue the wars abroad, to continue to protect ourselves here at home. It also justifies the funding for the surveillance apparatus here at home. I'm going to step back a little bit. I, I, I went forward a little bit. In the surveillance, we sort of see three levels. Uh, the first level is sort of quiet surveillance. They're, they're listing the, the mosques. So they list them. People are being watched, but people don't know that they're being watched. The second level is uh, people being watched, but then also being approached. So somebody gets, uh, uh, through the documentation we've done, somebody gets approached and said, please become an informant for us. They refuse, and then for the next two weeks, they get followed around in dark, unmarked cars. And they happen to be a cab driver, so they're being followed around for 12 hours a day. And they're terrified. And then they reach out to an attorney, and the attorney calls the NYPD, calls the FBI, and all of a sudden the cars disappear. So clearly he himself was not being investigated. They were just trying to get him to become an informant. In another incident, we find uh, a mosque in Queens uh, has this congregant that is inciting people to commit violence, to commit crimes, essentially encouraging people to engage in illegal activity. They throw out this congregant and then later discover that the congregant they threw out is an undercover officer. And now keep that in mind. And then the third level is when you have this expansive surveillance program and you don't find any actual threats that you then have to manufacture the threats. And that's the third level where these informants and undercovers go into the community where they don't find terrorists. Because so much money is being invested into these programs, they start to create terrorists. And how do they do this? Uh, an example from one of our own members, uh, uh, Shahwar Mateen Siraj was a 19-year-old Pakistani uh, young man, somebody that's very gullible, very easily manipulable, uh, has some mental capacity limitations. And he gets approached by an informant who, after failing at targeting the imam in the mosque next door, after failing at targeting other community members, then finds this vulnerable young man and uh, starts building a relationship with him. Uh, befriending him, becoming a mentor, trying to guide him on religious issues. After six months of gaining his trust, starts introducing uh, materials, pictures like what's happening in Palestine, pictures of what's happening in Iraq, and saying, look, look at what they're doing to our people. And so for somebody that's easily manipulable, easily able to emotionally rile him up. And then spending four to six months really riling him up, that's it. And then after he gets him really riled up, and this person that's never encountered these materials before is absolutely emotionally uh, sort of on fire, says, you have to do something. And as soon as he says, yes, we should do something, it becomes a conspiracy for terrorism. He gets arrested, and he's now serving 30 years in prison. This is somebody that has an IQ of 78, who the NYPD listed as a terrorist mastermind. Anybody that has an IQ of 78 and is a mastermind is, is a big question to me. 
So then these programs then justify the further funding. Look, we solved this case, so continue the funding for the NYPD surveillance program. The FBI uses the same exact policies. I would say more than 80% of the terror, so-called terrorism cases we've seen over the last 12 years fall into these categories. I mentioned the legitimization of war, but then most importantly, it silences dissent in particular in those very same communities that are being targeted abroad by wars. So you'll see the Muslim communities, the South Asian communities, the Arab communities uh, are very afraid to come out and speak out against the wars, to speak out against drones uh, because of this impending surveillance program. And then it's not, again, it's not just passive, but some people that have been vocal have themselves been personally been targeted. But then also it serves to silence dissent ac across communities broadly. Uh, these cases, like Mateen's, uh sort of serve as a lesson. That if you do not remain quiet, this is what could happen to you. Uh, we've seen this uh, across the country. Uh, you know, there's been the, uh, the targeting of uh, solidarity workers and Palestinian rights uh, workers uh, across the Midwest by the FBI. Uh, just as of yesterday, there was the arrest of uh, Sister Rasmia Ode in Detroit, uh, who's been targeted for her activism. Um, and they are able to use a mixture of policing, of FBI, of immigration, to target people in whatever ways that they can. Uh, I have a little bit of time left, so I want to quickly mention a few different connections uh, around the surveillance. A few years ago, there was reports coming, particularly from the Midwest, of people being approached by uh, what they uh, were being told were CIA officers and said that, oh, you know, why don't you come work for us? Why don't you provide us information? And then, you know, when they went to talk to lawyers and lawyers were like, the CIA can't operate domestically like that. And they actually approached the CIA and the CIA was like, no, actually that's not our officers. And then further investigation re uh, revealed that it was actually Mossad posing as FBI and CIA officers, Mossad being the Israeli intelligence. Uh, and trying to recruit people, particularly in the Arab community, uh, and, and get information from them. Now, you would think that uh, the FBI and the CIA would be outraged about this, that a foreign intelligence agency would come and operate on U.S. soil and, and do this, but obviously they did not do anything. They did not say anything. They remained quiet about this. Uh, we also know of lots of collaboration going on between inf law enforcement agencies. Uh, the U.S. Border Patrol goes regularly to Israel to get trained there on their uh, policies on, on how to do controlling on the border. But also local law enforcement agencies, local uh, police agencies uh, often go to Israel to receive training. There, we have heard some things about Israeli agencies coming here and receiving training. Uh, so I'm sure that exchange goes both ways. There's an exchange of weapons, exchange of technology, exchange of trainings. Uh, I'm sure somebody will talk about Elbit uh, in a bit, but uh, around the U.S.-Mexico border wall, uh, you know, there's an increasing militarization there, um, and uh, the surveillance for that border wall is provided by Elbit, which is an Israeli uh, corporation, um, and this ties into the further militarization of the border, but also of communities across the U.S. A, uh, the pending immigration bill immigration reform bill. You know, a, a lot of immigrant rights activists have been very excited about the bill. A lot of us have not. Uh, part of it is that it sets up the foundation for further militarization of the, uh, of the immigration system here. A big component of that bill is uh, for further drones on the, on the border. There's actually questions about whether they will be weaponized drones or not. The way the bill is written, it actually leaves the question open. Uh, I believe it's like uh, $40 billion which is a lot of money. Um, and then uh, the use of experts. I, I mentioned Mateen's case. A lot of these cases rely on so-called experts who can testify as to how this person, when they said that they want to go to Yemen to get married, they, they really don't mean married. Married is a code word for this and that and this. A lot of those experts are people that are former Israeli intelligence officers who then were involved uh, with different corporations that have set up their own organizations here and make lots of money providing this expertise. Uh, Evan Coleman being a, probably one of the most notorious ones, there's several other ones as well. 
Um, there is a long history, uh, obviously, um, of, uh, of Israel sort of supporting these sorts of policies elsewhere in Chile, in Brazil, in Guatemala, in South Africa, uh, in, uh, in the time of the Shah in Iran, uh, and also uh, currently in India. Uh, I think we'll uh, get a chance to talk about that a little bit more. I think just one question I want to uh, leave with is, uh, as Brother David was mentioning, what is the interest, why do we continue to spend money in militarization, in drones, in policing, rather than spending it on education? And I, uh, I have some answers, but I think that is a question we really need to think about and, and really start to dialogue. It is not just coincidence, it, it's, it's not mistaken, it's not just, oh, why don't we do this, or we're not thinking about that. This is very intentional. And it's very much related to the social and e economic system that we live in and in where, the direction that we're headed in. And unless we answer that question, a lot of these things just sort of seem haphazard and like you know, some bad people making bad choices, rather than being intentional and inherent to the systems that we live in. And we really have to answer that question. Thank you very, very much, Fahad. Yes, we'll have some interesting Q&A. Our next speaker is Reham Barhuti. She's a Palestinian-American activist who lived in the occupied Palestinian territory for 10 years. She currently resides in New York City, where she works as a teacher. Ms. Barhuti is a founding member of Adala New York, the New York Campaign for the Boycott of Israel, and PACB, the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Reham has been especially involved in Adela New York's TIAA CREF campaign, <coughs> which seeks the divestment by that major academic retirement fund manager from companies directly involved in Israel's military operations and development of technology specifically suited for the control and repression of Palestinian civilians, including Caterpillar, Elbit Systems, Northrop Grumman, and Veolia. Thank you, Terry, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm happy to be here on this panel. Uh, I think that the, that the topic we're discussing today is very important and central to a lot of our work and what we're doing. And I, I feel like hopefully what I want to try to bring is is how do we deal with this? How, how do we deal with all of this information that we're getting and make it something that we can actually impact and work on, right? So um, TIAA CREF is one of the largest pension funds in the world. It provides financial services for, sec for people in the academic field, the medical field, the cultural field, uh, faith-based organizations, and so on. And it, it touts itself as this socially responsible investment fund that works, quote, for the greater good. So uh, TIA CREF states that it is, quote, globally integrated approach that seeks to influence positive social change in the countries and communities in which it invests while helping its clients achieve their goal of a safe and secure retirement. But of course, this claim is quite questionable in light of TIA CREF's investments in companies like Caterpillar and Motorola and Veolia and Northrop Grumman and Elbit Systems, and Hewlett Packard, and Africa Israel, and G4S, and SodaStream, all of which implicate the retirement fund in Israel's systematic violation of Palestinian rights through such policies and practices as home demolition, land confiscation, the restriction of Palestinian freedom of movement, the killing of Palestinian civilians, and the strangulation of the Palestinian economy. If we take a closer look at some of the egregious activities of these companies, it will reveal the extent to which TIA CREF, and in turn its clients, of which some of us are, the extent to which we are complicit with the Israeli military industrial complex and its violations of international and law and human rights. So I want to quickly take a look at some of these companies, especially those that are involved in the military industrial complex, and, and, and look at what they're doing. Caterpillar, of course, is a U.S. American uh, firm that manufactures and provides bulldozers and civil engineering tools. But Caterpillar's D9 bulldozers 
that are sold to the Israeli army are then armored and modified to include machine gun mounts and grenade launchers. So these bulldozers have been used in war crimes in South Lebanon, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, including the 2008-2009 attack on Gaza, as was documented by the Goldstone Report. And of course, they've also been used to demolish Palestinian homes in the West Bank as an arbitrary punitive measure to build the separation wall and the illegal settlements on occupied Palestinian land. Of course, this makes Caterpillar in clear violation of international law and even US law, like the US Arms Con uh, Export Control Act, which states that foreign countries receiving weapons as military aid must use them only for internal security and legitimate self-defense. Elbit is an Israeli company, defense company, one of the largest. It has been heavily involved in the construction of the apartheid wall in the West Bank, also the wall between the US and Mexico. It provides systems and products for border security, surveillance, uh, including observation systems and smart fences. And Elbit produces the unmanned aircraft systems and the un unmanned aircraft vehicles, or the drones, um, which David talked about, including the US Hermes 450 and the US Her and the Hermes 900, which were able to carry weapons such as the Hellfire or the Spike missiles. And those were used in the 2008-2009 attack on Gaza. They were used on the attack on the Gaza flotilla in 2010 and in targeted assassinations and killings as documented by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. And through its subsidiary, Elbit uh, Soltum, Elbit produces mortar ammunition, including the white phosphorus uh, mortar shells that were used by the Israeli army in the 2008-2009 attack on Gaza, which has led many to accuse Israel of war crimes. G4S is another company, it's a British-Danish a security conglomerate that operates in about 120 countries and through its Israeli subsidiary, G4S provides security system for Israeli prisons and detention centers in Israel and in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, these prisons house Palestinian political prisoners, including children, some of which are under administrative detention, which means they are being held without charge or trial. And of course, holding Palestinian prisoners from the West Bank and Gaza in prisons inside Israel is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which prohibits the transfer of detained individuals from the occupied territory. G4S also provides security service for the Israeli military checkpoints, businesses operating in the Israeli settlements, and the Israeli police headquarters in the occupied West Bank. Hewlett Packard. So Hewlett Packard's EDS Israel is responsible for developing integrating and maintaining the basal system, which is in a biometric ID system installed in Israeli checkpoints in the occupied West Bank, and it's used to control Palestinian freedom of movement. <coughs> HP also has major contracts with various sections of the army, including a two-year contract to supply all PCs to the army, a three-year virtualization tender, and a contract for outsourcing um, the Navy's IT infrastructure. Israeli Navy's IT infrastructure, including the management and operation of its computer and communication center. Uh, then you have Motorola Solutions, who through its uh, subsidiary, Motorola Solutions Israel, profits from Israel's control of the Palestinian population by providing surveillance systems around Israeli settlements and checkpoints and military camps in the West Bank, as well as by providing communication systems to the Israeli army. Motorola Solutions Israel sells and services Moto Eagle surveillance system, the latest virtual fences systems of radar, thermal cameras, and communication devices specifically designed to control Palestinian movement in vast, what they call special security zones that surround Israeli settlements. The system is also used at the illegal apartheid wall and the wall around Gaza and on Israeli military bases. Motorola is the provider of the primary mode of communication for the Israeli military, including the Mountain Rose cellular communication systems that has been installed in a wide range of armored vehicles. And finally, you have Northrop Grumman, one of the world's largest arms manufacturers, of course, profits from the production of parts for the Apache uh, AH-640D Longfellow hel helicopter and the Hellfire II missiles, as well as parts for the F-16 aircraft. And this weaponry has been used by Israel to kill thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese civilians since 1995. In 2008, Northrop uh, in initiated a formal partnership 
with the Israeli government-owned Israeli arms industry to outfit Israeli combat aircrafts with radar and missile firing capabilities. In a 2009 report on Israel's 2008-2009 attack on Gaza, Amnesty International highlighted Israel's attacks using F-16s and Hellfire missiles. And in 2010, Northrop equipped Apaches were essential to the IDF's mission Seabreeze, which attacked the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. So what do we do with this information? In 2010, Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP, launched the We Divest campaign to place pressure on TIA craft to withdraw its investments in these companies, as well as SodaStream, <coughs> Veolia, and Africa Israel, for their role in supporting and profiting from the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Now, the We Divest campaign is coordinated by a national committee. It's made up of rep representatives of JVP, Adela New York, the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation, the American Friends Service Committee, Grassroots International, and the U U.S. Palestinian Community Network. Over 25,000 people have signed on to the We Divest petition, and a number of community, academic, and faith-based groups have launched campaigns that either directly are aimed at TIAA craft or at one of the companies targeted by the campaign. For example, a number of students uh, for justice campus groups, including NYU and Columbia, have, have launched TIA craft campaigns on their campuses and have gotten hundreds of signatures from faculty and students. There have been caps, campus actions to challenge TIA craft representatives, including just last week when JVP Ithaca and uh, Cornell SJP confronted the TCREF uh, CEO, Roger Ferguson. The We Divest campaign has submitted two resolutions over the years, both of which were prohibited from being presented at the shareholders' meetings. Nevertheless, CREF clients have attended every shareholders' meeting to challenge TIA CREF while carrying out lively multi-city protests outside TIA CREF offices in New York, in Chicago, in San Francisco, in Boston, and elsewhere. Now, the We Divest campaign complements and supports a number of the boycott and divestment initiatives that are being carried out that focus on one of the target companies. Through local, national, and international BDS actions, these companies have begun to feel the pressure of the concerted effort being carried out by BDS activists that are raising the cost of doing business with Israel as usual. In a report to the General Assembly on October 25, 2012, the UN Special Rapporteur, Richard Falk, called on the General Assembly and civil society to boycott a number of the companies targeted by the We Divest campaign. In terms of Elbit, it has faced significant pressure from the international movement for BDS, leading government funds and private financial institutions in New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark to divest. G4S, following a campaign by Danwatch, exposing G4S's role in the occupation and concerted BDS efforts in Europe, G4S published a statement in March 2011 regarding its operations in the West Bank that stated that, quote, G4S will aim to exit a number of contracts which involve the servicing of security equipment at the barrier checkpoints, prisons, and police stations in the West Bank. Of course, it has yet to live up to that aim, and as such, BDS movement continues to place pressure on that company. Another target of the We Divest campaign is SodaStream for its production in an illegal Israeli settlement, and it's quickly becoming a target of one of the largest growing BDS campaigns in the United States. So the US campaign to the Israeli occupation helped organize an interfaith boycott SodaStream coalition, which included Christian, Muslim, Christian, and other faith-based member groups. The coalition has done some really interesting work, including a spoof of last year's SodaStream Super Bowl ad, and this year, the network is inviting organizations around the U.S. to take part in SodaStream 2013 Holy Days of Action between November 29th and December 10th. And plans are underway for actions to take place in New York, so keep your eyes out. Veolia has been the target of an international BDS campaign, such as Derail Veolia, for many years. The campaign has resulted in the company's loss of more than 16 billion in canceled or withdrawn contracts, including 7.5 billion contract in North London. Veolia has also become a target here in the United States in campaigns in St. Louis, Missouri, and in Northern California. These concerted BDS efforts have led to tangible results on the ground. Just this past month, 
Veolia Transdiv, which through its Israeli subsidiary, Connex, operated bus lines for settlers on segregated roads in Palestinian West Bank and other lines through, throughout Israel, sold off all of its bus lines in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. As we can see, the BDS movement has been much more successful targeting companies not directly involved in the Israeli military industrial complex. This is because targeting military companies is quite difficult. These companies are pure evil. It's not just what they're doing in Palestine that is wrong. They profit and they exist off the killing and injuring and violations of human rights. But campaigns like We Divest, because they target a self-proclaimed socially responsible investment company like TIA Cref, which is then answerable to morally conscientious individuals, provides the means by which we can act impact the seemingly untouchable military industrial complex. These campaigns reveal our own complicity in the brutal Israeli occupation and colonization of Palestine. And it's important because it provides us with a means for taking action. It takes the power from the military and big businesses and it places it in our hands. As such, we're not forced to wait until the military industrial complex grows a conscience or until our government decides to uphold international law. Since we are all complicit, we can all take action to bring about change. Whether it be in our communities, or our stores, or our faith-based organizations, or our universities, or our unions, or our pension funds, we can work to begin to hold ourselves and the institutions in which we have operate accountable. We can make war and occupation and colonization and the violation of human rights a little less profitable. We can work together to ensure that we end our own complicity, the complicity of our organizations, and hold them up to their commitment to be socially responsible and work for the greater good. And I just want to say that I think we can see from the international efforts and, and those examples that I gave that the BDS movement is working. But the best example and the best proof of that is the Israeli government's response to the BDS movement. So recently in an article on the electronic intifada, um, they quoted an article that came out in Haaretz where Enshel uh, Pfeiffer uh, is quoted. He reveals in Haaretz this weekend, today's battle is BDS, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign being waged against Israel. Significant efforts are being invested by the government and pro-Israel organizations to fend off BDS. This week, I discovered that in the Israeli embassy in London alone, there are two people one diplomat and one local employee whose full-time brief, a full-time brief is to monitor and counter BDS attacks. Apparently the foreign ministry with its diplomatic corps is not enough and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has <coughs> added fighting BDS to the responsibilities of the strategic affairs minister. Netanyahu said the ministry would coordinate efforts, quote, coordinate efforts with NGOs, non-governmental organizations in Israel and all over the world, a role which would include the establishment of professional special staff for countering delegitimization. And I think that that shows more than anything the strength and the power of the BDS movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next and final speaker is Anna Kilcutt. Anna is a New York City resident who, in response to hearing that Cornell University was partnering with an Israeli institution, helped form New Yorkers Against the Cornell Technion Partnership, or NIAC, in 2012, which has become the focus of her activism. In response to the Palestinian call for the academic boycott of Israel, NIAC campaigns for an end to the partnership of Cornell University and New York City with Technion. Through street protests, public talks, press articles, and online social media, NIACT has helped counter the mainstream discourse by exposing Technion's involvement in Israel's illegal occupation and oppression of Palestinians. As part of the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions BDS movement, NIACT works at the local level within a global network. Um, So, as some of you may know, um, in December 2010, Mayor Bloomberg announced a competition to build a massive 2.1 million square foot 
Applied Sciences and Engineering Campus in Manhattan. And he was offering $100 million in our taxpayer money and free land for this campus. Various universities then made bids, including Stanford University, who were front runners until close to the end. However, as we all now know, Cornell University and the Technion Israel Institute of Technology won the competition. So behind closed doors, Technion and Cornell had come to an agreement to enter the competition as a partnership. And this was decided um, without, without consulting the staff, faculty, or students at Cornell, which is actually in violation of their own bylaws. Mm -hmm. And it was done with as little information as possible being given out about Technion. The two universities waited until 10 days before the city's deadline for proposals to reveal their union publicly. And then the winning bid was announced in December 2011 and it's now known as Cornell NYC Tech or Cornell Tech. And since then, reporting on the campus has scarcely mentioned the involvement of Technion, despite Cornell claiming that it was the inclusion of Technion that enabled them to win the bid. So the proposed campus is to be built on prime real estate on Roosevelt Island. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, can you hear me at the back if I speak? No. Sorry. <laughs> So the proposed campus is to be built on prime real estate on Roosevelt Island, which, as it's been mentioned, is in the East River between the Upper East Side of Manhattan and Queens. And it will take about 25 years to construct, and it entails the demolition of Goldwater Hospital, which is a long-term care facility on the island. And it will include space for private companies as well on the campus. Since December 2012, this collaboration now includes Google, who donated free office space in their Chelsea building to house the collaboration until their first academic building is complete on Roosevelt Island in 2017. So New York is against the Cornell Technion Partnership, or NIAC, formed in February of 2012 to oppose the collaboration of Cornell and Technion. We formed in response to the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and in particular the call for an academic boycott of Israel. So we oppose any collaboration with any Israeli academic or cultural institute on the grounds that we don't support the whitewashing of Israeli apartheid. And whilst most Israeli universities are involved in one way or another in supporting Israeli apartheid and the occupation, Technion really is an extreme example, um, and certainly the most notorious and prestigious university or institute that cooperates with the Israeli military. Quoting from a New York Times article earlier this year, Yossi Vardi, who has founded or helped to found more than 60 companies in Israel and has five degrees from the Technion, states, I can say without exaggeration that Israel could not have been built without the Technion. There is a Technion graduate behind practically every highway, desalinization plant, new missile technology, and startup company in the country. So why do we oppose Technion coming to New York City? Um, I'm going to talk first about their connections with surveillance operations, and then I'll talk about their involvement with weapons development. Can you still hear me? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try my best to speak loud, I'm sorry. So the American Technion Society, which is a kind of PR um, and fundraising outlet for Technion in New York City, stated in a YouTube video that the world often turns to Israel for a surveillance um, for anti-terror and surveillance technology, but where does Israel turn? The Technion. For example, the Technion's Faculty of Electrical Engineering has developed dehazing technologies which are used to improve surveillance images um, gathered by unmanned airborne drones. Technion works with a large number of companies in Israel and worldwide, and this includes collaborations between academic departments and the private sector to develop specific technologies. It includes having students work in partnership with the private sector um, on particular projects. 
they train the graduates that then go on to make up the workforce of companies, so the engineers, the CEOs, the vice presidents, and they invite companies to take part in graduate recruitment affairs on campus. There's already a visiting assistant professor from Technion teaching at Cornell Tech at the Google offices, and his department, in particular the computer science department at Technion, has a, a lot of collaborations with companies, including Raphael Advanced Defense Systems, Elbit Systems, which Reham has mentioned, and Google, as well as some less well-known companies, such as Converse, Amdox, and Checkpoint. And Technion also has close links with Verint and Nice Systems. So these less well-known companies are actually very interesting, and I'll go on to talk about them. Nice Systems, Converse, and Checkpoints are three of Israel's largest high-tech companies, and they're all influenced by technology developed by Unit 8200, which you may know is Israel's version of the NSA. Um, they are involved in the surveillance of Palestinian phone and internet traffic. Checkpoint and NICE were founded by Unit 8200 alumni, and one of Converse's main products is based on the unit's technology. Converse develops and markets telecommunication software used, among other things, to direct airborne drones, and Checkpoint is an international provider of software and hardware products for IT security. The ironically named NICE Systems specializes in telephone voice recording, data security and surveillance, as well as systems that analyze this recorded data. NICE lists amongst its leading customers the New York Police Department and the Miami Police Department. Verint, which acquired Converse in February this year, is considered the world leader in electronic interception, and Amdocs is the world's largest billing service for telecommunications. Both companies are based in Israel and are heavily funded by the Israeli government, having connections to the Israeli military and intelligence, and both have major contracts with the US government. Verint and Amdox form part of the backbone of the US government's domestic intelligence surveillance technology, um, and Verint was one of the companies which, to which the Verizon and AT&T outsourced their mass wiretapping of US citizens, as orchestrated by the NSA since 2001 and Amdox has been accused of wiretapping for which it was investigated by the FBI. Since 2006, Verint has worked with the US State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs to carry out a mass telephone surveillance system in Mexico. According to Verint's Mexico website, police forces, national security, intelligence, and other government agencies can use these solutions as part of a large-scale large system designed to generate evidence and intelligence. Verint is now headquartered on Long Island, and its president and CEO, a Technion graduate, has stated his, his enthusiastic support for the partnership of Technion with Cornell at a 2012 Israel Day event at the New York Stock Exchange. So Technion is also heavily involved in the research and development of military equipment, some of which has already been mentioned by other panel members. Specialists at Technion developed the remote control capabilities of the Caterpillar D9 tractor, which is the notorious armored bulldozer, um, an essential weapon of Israel's um, occupation, enabling the Israeli army to demolish approximately 25,000 Palestinian homes since 1967. This bulldozer performed remarkably during Operation Cast Lead, to quote an IDF officer, and is used by the Israeli military to destroy Palestinian homes, olive groves, and tunnels without any risk to its operators. As was mentioned before, the first modern drone was developed in Israel in 1973, and Israel has gone on to become the world's largest exporter of drones as well as using drones to kill over 800 Palestinians between 2006 and 2011 alone. Technion developed a program specifically for the research and development of drone technology and includes in its achievements a weaponized bomb-carrying stealth drone and the 9-inch wingspan surveillance dragonfly drone. 
Technion also has deep relations with two major military companies in Israel, Raphael Advanced Defense Systems, and, which is one of Israel's largest government-sponsored weapons manufacturers, and El Beat Systems, which has been mentioned before, which is one of Israel's biggest private weapons research companies. Raphael is famous for its armored hybrid armor protection system, which is used on the IDF's Merkava Mark IV main battle tank. Since 2001, Technion has had an MBA program tailored specifically for Raphael managers. Elbit is one of two main providers of the electronic detection fence, a key component of Israel's separation wall in the West Bank, which was ruled as being illegal by the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Elbit has also participated in the design of and provided surveillance technology for the US-Mexico border wall. Numerous agencies, as Rehan mentioned, have divested from LB due to their violation of human rights, including Norway's finance ministry, Denmark's largest financial institution, and Sweden's largest pension funds. In contrast, Technion established a center for the development of electro-optics in complete partnership with LB. Furthermore, Technion practices institutional discrimination against Palestinian students by severely restricting their freedom of speech and assembly and rewarding those Jewish students who, unlike most Palestinians, perform compulsory military service. So how would Technion impact New York City and beyond? I'm gonna read some of the descriptions that have been given about the proposed campus from the website of Cornell Tech. According to the website, instead of traditional departments, programs at the Cornell Tech campus will be organized around hubs, which will allow them to focus on generating technology to serve particular industry needs. Another unique aspect of the Cornell Tech program is that every student will have a mentor in industry, an industry mentor. The way in which Technion, Technion will formally be involved in the campus is through the Jacobs Technion Cornell Innovation Institute, the JTCII, which will be directed by Craig Gotsman, another Technion computer science um, professor. The institute will be responsible for a third of the academic activity on campus, and their hope is to build an ecosystem like Hyper's, Hyper is the city in Israel where Technion is based, um, so they hope to build an ecosystem like Hyper's, where industry and academics feed off each other. Their plan is to have interaction with industry facilitated through industrial liaisons who will forge and cultivate relationships between academic staff and the technology sector. These relationships will result in joint projects, sponsored research, and technology transfer from the campus to local industry. Industry mentors, entrepreneurs, and members of the venture capital community will be present on campus to help shape and guide students' industrial projects, some of which may lead to spin-off companies. So this makes it clear how the impact of Cornell Tech in the city will have far wider ranging effects than just the campus itself. And this is the first time that an Israeli institute has been involved in building a campus on US soil. So I don't think we can overstate the significance of Technion coming to New York City, being as it is an international hub of business and commerce. The acting, general, um, acting Consul General of Israel in New York stated that this is of strategic importance in terms of positioning Israel not only in America, but all over the world as a bastion of creativity and innovation. And Technion's senior executive vice president has stated, the relationships established will make it easier for Israeli entrepreneurs to gain access to US markets. So the academic boycott of Israel isn't only, or it is morally justified. When people ask, what about academic freedom? We have to ask not only whose freedom, but why should we elevate academic freedom above basic human rights? And crucially, the boycott is also strategically sound. Israel actively attempts to cover up its crimes by promoting its academic and technological achievements. 
and Israeli academic institutes, including Technion, rely on foreign investment. In 2011, the University of Johannesburg became the first to implement the academic boycott of Israel when it severed its links with Ben-Gurion University, ending a 25-year relationship. In April this year, the general membership of the Association for Asian American Studies, as well as the Teachers' Union of Ireland, both unanimously voted to support the boycott of Israeli universities, becoming respectively the first scholarly institution in the US and the first academic union in Europe to do so. And in June, the Federation of French-speaking students in Belgium, representing some 100,000 students from 25 institutions, voted to freeze relations with Israeli universities. Many world-renowned scholars have come out in favor of the boycott, including in June this year, Professor Stephen Hawking, who courageously boycotted Israel's presidential conference, and about which an editorial in the Boston Globe reported, the movement that Hawking has signed on to aims to place pressure on Israel through peaceful means. To see such a, main, see such a statement in a mainstream US broadsheet shows just how far things have come. The tide is turning, and these are just a handful of the victories that we've seen on campus. So we're not against education, jobs, science, and progress. We're against oppression, apartheid, discrimination, and the destruction of lives and homes. And we know that New York City needs jobs and education facilities, but surely these don't have to come at such a high price. Our campaign ultimately aims to get the City of New York administration and Cornell University to end their collaboration with Technion. And we need your help. We need to continue to raise awareness. Most people in New York still don't know about Technion. They know very little about their involvement and they know even less about what Technion actually do. And most people would not support $100 million in their taxes going towards an institute that develops drones and practices discrimination on its home campus. We may not have the financial resources to stand up to the city of New York, but with enough support and with time, we will make a difference. So how can you help? There are many ways. You can come and join us. Um, we have protests every two weeks at the Cornell Tech campus, um, which is at the Google offices now in Chelsea. We go there and we hold signs, we hand out information, we talk to the public. If you're concerned about this issue, you could write to your local paper, you could write to your student newsletter, um, your church paper, your community blog, or any other group that you're involved with. You could write to your elected officials and find out what they think about this. If you're already involved in activism of some sort, you could ask your activist friends what they think and see if you can tell them about what's happening. And as I'm sure it should have been made clear this evening, this issue doesn't just have to do with Israel-Palestine. It should be of interest to anyone involved in or concerned about militarization and surveillance as well. And if you would like help with any of this, if you want to speak to your local community group, your church, your mosque, your temple, um, you can get in touch with us. You can also look at all the resources that we have on our website, which include fully referenced reports as well as there will be a transcript of this talk, especially if you couldn't hear me, that might be useful. Um, and we will be uploading the, the video that's being filmed of all this evening's talks. Um, our website and our email address should be on the program that you've all been handed out. And if you want to get onto our announcements email list, you can sign up. There's a sign up sheet at the door on the table. Um, you can email us and that will allow us to keep in touch with you and let you know about what we're doing. Um, and what you can take part in with us, the, the protests and events and so on. Um, and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. And so we will be outside Google in Chelsea again this coming Tuesday from 5 till 7. We would love for people to come and join us. You're welcome to come even if you just want to talk to us and find out more about what we're doing. Um, so with that, on behalf of NIAX, I would like to thank everyone for coming. Um, all of the people in the audience and the speakers, and also to say um, how great it is to be holding it here at Judson Memorial Church, which has a long history, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, of working in um, social justice 
issues. And Terry is about to hand out a box. So they actually gave us the space for no charge at all. We would like to contribute something to give back to them. So we're just handing out a box if anyone would like to contribute. And with that, um, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Terry for a few minutes. Thank you very much for these uh, very inspiring, interesting, and informative talks. Um, I would like to open the, the floor to questions, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to take uh, three questions at a time, and then we'll hand the floor back to the panelists, and they can answer as, as they will. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Ann. I, I know Terry, and I know Anna. Um, I, I just want to say, I'll get to my question in a minute. This is just, this is racism on steroids. I don't know if you know, it's, it's fitting that we're having this meeting in October as Columbus came across, he finally got the money from Queen Isabella from Spain to come across to America. And the first thing that we did was the only good Indian is the dead Indian. And I, one of my questions would be, have any of you been to Arizona and have you seen the indigenous Native American population, which is still starving to death in, in Arizona and in America. They are starving to death. And your question, my question there is, have you researched the Bureau of Indian Affairs? The second point is a group called the Ku Klux Klan. After the southern plantation owners brought slaves from Africa, they were slaves. But when the, after the slaves were set free, the Ku Klux Klan was a group that was rather determined to make sure that none of the Africans and their descendants would have the power, would have access to clean water, clean air, green grass, fresh food, and education. I don't think that we have really eradicated the Ku Klux Klan in any way, shape, or form. And we have yet to let the Native Americans have a nice day. They're not having a nice day. So when, um, let's see, so that is, that is my question. Do you have any perspective on 2013 compared to uh, the 19th century? Ago, there was a Libyan guy that that the government wanted, and they grabbed him from the, the streets, and they took him to a ship in the Mediterranean and and interrogated him for about a week. Then they brought him here, but he was given no no access to a lawyer. It was as if he was rendered in a new kind of way. But you were correct to say that the Obama administration said, at least we didn't kill him. We didn't send a drone after him. So I thought that you picked out something very important about the whole way in which the Obama administration is going after indefinite detention, drone killings, targeted killing, and rendering people um, as if this, and they are making a justification for it that it is not against international law in all of these cases. And here, we're talking about whole countries being targeted and terrorized by what the U.S. is doing. I just wondered if you could develop that a little bit more. Okay, one more question? Yes. Um, I, I can't remember who was talking about targeting uh, peace activists, but if you could just expand, you know, I never realized that um, that's, a, that's a very strong parallel. But, Israel compared to the to the U.S. because peace groups in Israel under this administration um, have been raided and harassed and targeted. I think even some legislation was passed. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. So, who would like to start? Can I start with something that's off topic a little bit? I should have talked about it earlier, and I just want to say it before anybody else leaves. Um, for those of you that are interested in other kinds of BDS, we have two cultural boycott actions coming up. On Sunday, we are going to be protesting in Dan Rachel, 
and on Tuesday we are going to be protesting the Israeli Philharmonic and you can get more information off of the Adela New York website if you're interested. So just keep it in mind for if anybody wants to leave here and really is excited about doing something, you go for an hour Tuesday to the right. Nyack protest and then you come <laughs> and continue with the cultural boycott protest. I'll let the answering of the questions to people more adapt that the topic. Yeah. Um, around the issue of, of uh, indigenous peoples here, um, we, uh, you're almost part of a delegation that went to the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, I believe in uh, 2007, and uh, you know the same place that this border wall is being built, where the surveillance technology on it is by uh, Elbit, uh, the wall runs through uh, indigenous lands, uh, and, and in Arizona specifically to the Tonoho Odom Nation. So here's a group of people that have lived on that land for thousands of years, and now the U.S. Border Patrol and the people that are building the wall want to dictate when and how they can cross their own lands. And this is a nation that exists on both sides of the border. And so the folks that are on the Mexican side of the border face much greater troubles uh, compared to the ones on the U.S. side. But there's literally people that are being killed by the U.S. Uh, we met uh, mothers who had lost their sons uh, because the Border Patrol, driving around like cowboys, run children over on the reservation. Um, I think partially as a result of making these connections, I know there's been delegations from the U.S., from uh, indigenous uh, uh, nations, activists, students, academics that have gone to Palestine, and, and there have been reciprocal uh, delegations from Palestinian activists uh, that have also gone and, and visited them. And those are connections that we need to continue to highlight. Um, but I think it's right to point out that being a settler colonial state means that there is racism inherent into the project. Both the US project and the Israeli project, racism is inherently implied to it. You cannot be a settler colonial state without being founded on racism. Uh, around, around the interrogation of, of peace activists, um, yes, it, it is very alarming uh, because peace activists, anti-war activists, solidarity activists are the front line of pushing against the discourse. Right? So if you start to silence them, if you start to prosecute them, uh, it uh, exponentially sort of uh, expands the ability of the government to continue to push forward their propaganda to push forward what they want to say because this front line has sort of been neutralized or been eliminated. Uh, whether it's through grand jury subpoenas, whether it's through imprisonment, whether it's just through fear of surveillance. Um, and we see that both here in New York City. Uh, it's a reason that the NYPD, of, of, of all people, really takes an interest in anti-war activists and in peace activists. Uh, and the same reason that the FBI also takes, takes an interest in them. Um, and those people that have been targeted, I forget what was the number of them, is the FBI file? The ones in the Midwest? Uh, there's there's a, you know, a, a big group of activists, particularly across the Midwest, who have been targeted uh, in Chicago, in Minneapolis, uh, and, and people should really, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of them now, but the Coalition to Stop FBI Repression has been leading the efforts uh, in, in their defense. Those folks need solidarity. Uh, and stop FBI.net. Stop FBI.net. Um, but as movements, we need to come to the defense of those people because if, if, if we don't stop it there, it's, it's going to expand. And, and, and that shouldn't be the reason. It should be out of genuine solidarity that an attack on any one of us is an attack on all of us. And, and those folks need to be defended. I would just add uh, that you know every technology that has existed up to this point has been abused and is being abused uh, to go after activists, to go after nonviolent agitators, uh, to restrict and intimidate and take away our rights of speech and assembly. And that will be true with every new technology unless we change 
something. Uh, there, there's nothing built into drones or any new technology that's going to mean they won't be used in that way and they already are being used in that way. And peace groups from Veterans for Peace in Boston, to, I mean across the country, dozens and dozens of peace groups right now have been infiltrated um, by, uh, and their nonviolent, non-threatening, non-criminal activities recorded at great length and the and the infiltration and the and the surveillance continuing. Uh, I I came up to New York City on the train from D.C. and uh, someone emailed me that they were going to protest at our U.S. senators' uh, offices, who do such a wonderful job. And and uh, I got there, and a NYPD officer came up and said, "So who who are you bringing up here on the train from D.C.?" I, I mean, they, they they just don't care about letting you know. The that they're, they're reading this is the idea. that they're reading your emails. Um, I I would say to Deborah that um, I I think it was very interesting to watch people's reaction uh, to this this uh, uh, man Al Libby who actually has been uh, indicted and is being prosecuted in New York uh, and that is actually something of a step up uh, from this endless murdering of people uh, without charging them with crimes, uh, who in many, if not most cases, could clearly have been captured rather than killed. Um, but it was interesting to see people's reactions because some people cheered for not having blown this man up together with whoever was nearby, instead having kidnapped him. You know, something we have two dozen CIA agents convicted for and waiting uh, to be sent over to Italy to serve, serve their jail time. I don't know that, that it will ever happen, uh, but it's not actually legal to kidnap people and, and ship them out of the country or secretly interrogate them without a lawyer on a, on a ship. I mean, this was new and scandalous when Bush started this with the, uh, the American Taliban uh, young man. Um, and, and then there were other people uh, who thought that this was worse. This is worse than killing people with drones because this is Bush-like. This is torture. Uh, it's cleaner to kill people. Um, so, you know, and, and the guy had to go on a hunger strike to get off the ship and get brought to New York. Uh, God knows what was done to him. No lawyer knows. His family doesn't know. Um, so it's, you know, to, we're, we're almost at the point where Bush policies really are a step up from policies that have become commonplace and accepted humanitarian warish policies, uh, which ought to be a, a bucket of cold water in our face. Um, I, I would say to the first question, which I, I take the gist of it to be sort of the, the U.S. is as bad as Israel, so how are we in the U.S. sitting here talking about boycotting mm. Israel for its crimes? Uh, and I, I have to agree. Um, it's very very strange because the United States wiped out its indigenous populations. We have Texas frackers protected by Canadian mounted police throwing the indigenous people off their land up north of Maine. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't end. And around the world where U.S. military operations are happening, they still talk about Indian territory. Uh, they still name the drones and the weapons for the Indian tribes that they wiped out. They still use the cavalry and get into their costumes from uh, Indian slaughter days uh, for official events. Uh, and there isn't anything more acceptable or moral or legal about U.S. militarism uh, than Israeli militarism. Uh, we have to uh, resist them both. I mean, we have concentration camps for Native Americans that served as models for the Nazis, who served as models for where Israel is putting people now. Uh, and it's all evil. It's all equally evil. Uh, and we have to stop thinking in terms of representing a nation and protesting another nation. We're humans, and we're protesting uh, violations of human rights uh, wherever they happen. Build on that. Yes. I, I think that, the, that, that this is one of the issues and this is one of the strengths of something like boycott and divestments because this has always been a tool of different oppressed groups in different areas, whether it was uh, apartheid South Africa or the civil rights movement here in the U.S. And I think the Palestinian movement builds off of that. 
And I think it also now is beginning to give back to that. So you have things like, you know, um, Stevie Wonder deciding to carry out a boycott of Florida um, after the Trayvon Martin uh, injustice that was carried out there. There's, there's places where these movements do connect, and I think that they do connect most strongly when they come from a place of nonviolence, because then they're not just opposing the oppression in order to replace one oppressed people with another. It's the idea of, you know, um, hitting the system from from its basis. So you use you utilize these these um, tools that empower you and strengthen you without using the you know the the the, the basis upon which the system is established to keep you oppressed. So I think that this is where our work comes in. Yes? Yeah, what, if anything, is happening on the Cornell campus with regard to this issue? Um, well, the Students for Justice in Palestine have been very active. They are, the, the problem, though, is that they're based in Ithaca, right? So the main Cornell campus is way up in Ithaca. This is happening in New York City. So. The Students for Justice in Palestine at Cornell became involved before it was really made a huge public thing. They sort of found out slightly before that, and they went to the administration at Cornell and said, we're very against this, you know, we haven't been consulted as students, um, and can we discuss, you know, can we voice our opposition, and why are you doing this, and we want you to stop this partnership going ahead. And Cornell said to them, well, we're not going to stop it, but we could bring you in for negotiations about contracts. Okay. And they said, no, we, we're, there's no compromise here. We don't want them involved. So that was kind of their, um, you know, they went to the administration and said what they had to say. Apart from that, there have been one, there's been one faculty who has stood up against it, and he sat on panels, you know, with Cornell administration and the SJP. And then a handful, maybe four or five, um, who have sort of said, you know, they might have signed a petition, and that's it. We, we actually tried early on to see if we could get a letter from the faculty, or, uh, you know, maybe and students, but faculty written to the administration. Nobody would really sign on to anything. And, and what about the alumnus, Cornell alumnus, who donated billions of dollars for this project. Oh, well, they're very happy about it. I mean, so they, if you, him? Chuck Feeney. Has anybody been able to, I know he's a very secretive private person. Yeah, I mean, he's an interesting. Has anybody been able to reach him? Uh, no, not that I know of, not that I know of. I mean, he, I'm sure, you know, is, well, he knows what's happening and he's given his blessing, I'm sure. Um, I think contacting him would be a token gesture at this stage. Um, we're sort of also going after other people involved, um, the architects, for example. They have all these buildings that are going to go up. There are various points during this whole campus construction that we can target various different groups, the unions that are involved in building. Well, they don't care. So the problem is, is it's hard are, to find anyone that does, to be honest. The architects are already going out. So, and, and this is a very complicated you know, the bidding process and, and the review of the, the submissions and all of this. Uh, I don't know the extent to which contracts have already been given out, but one of the complexities of the, the construction and bidding process is that, you know, if, if you cancel a contract, there are probably penalties that if the contractor can't move forward with the project, the government, New York City, the taxpayer, then can get sued for you know them not being able to move forward. So the, the point at which it needs to be stopped is before contracts are signed. And I believe the bidding and contract process has actually been going on for a few couple, two or three years already. Yeah, this is the problem. As I mentioned, it's been done very secretively. It's very hard to get information. Um, we kind of started to go to the community board meetings on the island as soon as we heard about it. But at that point, I think a lot of this had already already been set up. Facts so, on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, and um, also, I just read an article about how, the, uh, I don't know all the complexities about uh, New York City law with regard to uh, the bidding process. However, uh, under Bloomberg, the um, percentage 
of no bid contracts has ballooned massively, massively. So you have to look at you know the New York City uh, contract law in order to see yeah. if there are violations. There were, I mean, I don't know legally. Oh, how the, how yeah. the contracts are let. Well, Stanford's own legal um, counsel had said they'd never seen negotiations done so badly by such a reputable body. The way that, so what happened is Stanford were the front runners until very, very close to the end. Everyone thought they were a shoe in And then Cornell or the city of New York started to change their requirements. They, they, they made them have to agree to have the whole campus up and running sooner than they had already stated they could do it. And Stanford then just couldn't achieve, they couldn't set out plans that would fulfill these new arrangements and had to pull out. Is it so, the New York City Department of Design and Construction that's letting the bids? Um, it's another department. The, um, do you remember the name of it, Terry? <laughs> it's, it's another one of Bloomberg's departments. The, um, but, you know, it's well, all these are established New York City agencies. And normally something like this would be the Department of Design and Construction. Sure. I think there's other questions as well. Yes. In the back. Yes, this is not a question but a comment that I would like to connect with David. You spoke so clearly. You spoke so clearly and so uh, forcefully about uh, drones and how immoral they are and how diabolical they are. Uh, uh, this is just something uh, in the push for our uh, military attack on Syria. One of our major political figures, I'm not sure if it was Joe Biden or, um, or Kerry, said uh, the attack would be more palatable to the American public because we would use drones rather than boots on the ground. I just found that so offensive that it's palatable, the very term is palatable, that war is palatable. And it's better to use drones to pull up the other guys rather than this American. Well, uh, do you want to take more questions? More questions? I'll, yes. I'll respond. Okay. How, I just want to ask, how much do you feel like the, the current sort of manufactured and exaggerated threat of Iran as a sort of nuclear threat to Israel or to the world is being used to sideline from the Palestinian flight, particularly now with plans to displace 40,000 Bedouins from the Negev desert? Yeah, it's more a comment to David's uh, rebuttal to uh, Deborah's question on the uh, Libyan. It was uh, extraordinary renditioned off the streets of Tripoli. I think what has to be taken in mind is that this is going to be a showcase trial. This is a home of 9-11. The government, Department of Justice, is looking for a big win. Not only that, but woe unto the lawyer that gets to represent him. Remember Lynn Stewart. Okay, I'll take one more. All right, please. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll reply and everybody else can uh, jump in too, but I, I think uh, that, that it is actually accurate, uh, if offensive, to say that Americans in polls uh, uh, prefer uh, wars with drones to wars with piloted aircraft or troops on the ground. Uh, I think that, that's, that, that you can make a pretty good case for that. Uh, just as there's clearly at least 20% of the American public that thinks killing someone with a drone is good if they're not an American and bad if they're an American. Um, and uh, I, I think it's you know incredibly offensive, um, but there is some truth to it. Uh, in defense of John Kerry, I think he really ought to be the salesman for every future war because we'll never have a war again. I mean, this guy, uh, he couldn't sell a used car, and he he couldn't persuade you know the the people who wanted a small war that it was just going to send a message and nothing was going to happen and nobody was going to get hurt and he couldn't persuade the people uh, who wanted to overthrow the government of Syria so they could hurry up and overthrow the nuclear threat in Iran that that it was going to 
move things in that direction either. Everybody thought he was lying. Uh, and then his, you know, secular Democrats who blew up the gas line and cut off the power today when they were done chopping off heads, uh, that, that, that somehow his missiles were going to magically create a secular democracy. You know, nobody, nobody bought it. Um, and, and he was doing his darndest. Um, so I, I would love for John Kerry to be, you know, our permanent war salesman uh, from here on out. Um, I, I do think that, that Israel would much rather be seen as a victim than as an aggressor. Uh, and it is much easier to talk about the Iranian uh, nuclear weapons program, albeit the non-existent Iranian nuclear weapons program, uh, than to talk about the, uh, the occupied territory. Um, it, it just uh, it is much better uh, propaganda uh, for Israel. I, uh, I was kind of overwhelmed by uh, Max Blumenthal's new book on uh, Israel and the fact that they have a television program where, where a competition program for who can spout the best uh, Israeli propaganda that, uh, that twists the truth most uh, radically. So it's, it's very, very self-aware, willful uh, belief uh, in the goodness of evil actions, uh, perhaps beyond uh, where we've reached yet uh, in this country, and that's, that's saying something. Um. I, I mean, definitely, there's this kind of, you know, uh, every time the, there's an increase in criticism of Israel or there's any kind of confrontation or even a U.S., you know, even attempt to kind of question Israeli policy, they will tout, you know, Iran or Syria or another kind of situation in order to, you know, readdress and reposition themselves and, and, and represent themselves. And it's, you know, it's, it's ironic because they are the only country in the, in the Middle East uh, that has, you know, nuclear weapons and, ha and has used white phosphorus bombs and has, you know, carried out these types of attacks against civilian populations in Gaza and Lebanon <coughs> and elsewhere. So it's, it's this, uh, uh, definitely this attempt to kind of, um, you know, get people to look, look to the other side for a minute. But I don't think that it's working anymore. I think this is Israel's major problem, is that all of its old attempts, where, whether it's you know, um, criticizing anybody that criticizes Israel and calling them an anti-Semite, whether it's talking about you know, continuously reminding Israel, uh, you know, the world that Israel is a victim, whether it's trying to work off of European guilt, whether it's all of these attempts are increasingly falling you know, because, the, because of the clarity and the extent of, of the brutality of the occupation and the treatment of Palestinians living inside Israel and the treatment of the Palestinian refugees and the increasing pressure by people within civil society to tell governments, you need to look at international law. You cannot keep allowing Israel to get away with it. So there's this kind of concerted effort and pressure in addition to Israel's increasing brutality that both are kind of bringing up to light any of these attempts to redirect people's attention. Yes, sir. How much influence do you think that uh, Christian Zionists in the United States has over the policies of our elected officials and our government in general? Or do they have that much influence? Thank you. Carl? Yeah, uh, I wonder if you, if you could tell us uh, what it is that Israel has uh, that makes them so able to compete I mean, in military research, for example, they're able to do things uh, that we wouldn't, can't do legally, uh, like the kinds of things they throw at the Palestinians, the kind of, and, and the way they try out uh, crowd control that we couldn't do in this country. So maybe you can give, enlighten us a little bit about that. Uh, and of course, it's not a question, it's maybe for Rehan. Uh, you touched upon it, but this the failure of uh, the propaganda efforts by the Israelis are so have been so uh, brought to the fore recently by their deciding that they're going to spend not 50, not 100, but 300 million dollars a year on, on anti Hasbara uh, work. When we saw just two days ago, the ADL put out a list of the most 10 threatening 
organizations in the United States. Uh, and I just, I looked up, because they had the names of the organizations and their budget figures. Well, the total of these budgets for these organizations, I mean, was one, it was minuscule. Most of these organizations are less than a million dollars a year, and they're the huge threats to Israel and the world. So there's huge failure there, and of course we should be intimidated by the $300 million. But let's face it, the mega billions of dollars that we've spent on defense over the last 40 or 50 years has bought us nothing but failure. Bought this nation nothing but failure in our military, in our military. Anyway, that's, those are comments and questions, but maybe you might and let, let, me, let me take one more question, and uh, we are we do have to wrap up, so we'll, we'll take this. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask you a question on, uh, pertaining to academic boycotts, how would you be able to try to pressure separation or severance from a satellite campus, because I personally go to NYU, which is one of the strongholds of a lot of the propaganda machines that Israel employs, which we have seven different Zionist uh, clubs on campus, and it's been growing exponentially, and they have been to that do torment us and also the Muslim Student Associations, but I've been, we also have a campus on Tel Aviv, which has 13 people, so it's a very small campus, but I've been trying to figure out if there's any sort of way to go up against such a large propaganda machine that NYU has with direct connections to the state of Israel, but at the same time, like NYU should be on the forefront of fighting an academic boycott. So I was just wondering if you guys had any suggestions from either prior conflicts of uh, South Africa or any other sort of like situations like that. Can you make it quick? I just want to make one comment real quick. Okay. Um, just on a recent sort of uh, Israeli propaganda in, in mainstream U.S. media um, that pretty much appeals to sort of, say, the Western mind, the Western, Western sensibilities. Uh, there were two submissions to the New York Times. One, a video showing sort of um, anti-African, clearly racist rallies against uh, you know, refug refugees coming from Africa, from Sudan, and, and elsewhere in, in East Africa. And, uh, and then a, another submission showing Israeli hipsters in Haifa, I, 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 somewhere, I forget exactly where. And the New York Times allowed the Israeli hipster video to be promoted on, on their website, yet the, the, um, the video showing the racism was not. So, you know, here in the U.S. we're not given the full picture of what's happening in that country. Okay. Um, Alright, well, I think that the, that the first two questions, the Christian Zionist strength in this country and, and um, uh, the whole issue of the U.S.-Israeli connection, I think that people don't understand the depth of that connection. There is a religious component to it, right? There is a belief by uh, fu fundamentalist Christians that, you know, for some, I'm not very good in religion, but that ultimately all the Jews have to return to this area and then convert to Judaism or there's going to be something really bad happening. So there is this kind of theological argument. There is a historical connection. There is a political connection. But I think the big one, the really big one, is the money connection. And I think that this is all of what we were talking about, the military industrial complex and how profitable it is for the U.S. and Israel to be connected. And I, 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 you know, everybody says, well, which one is guiding which one? I think they're both, you know, equally responsible. And it's not about the U.S. and America. It's about the U.S. elite, business military elite, and the Israeli business military elite really benefiting from creating this havoc throughout the Arab world and here in the U.S. And, and this whole terrorism and, uh, you know, all of these kinds of ideas. And it was, I think, you know, Naomi Klein who said that really this is where Israeli military, you know, has a one-up on everybody because they have this ongoing showcase. They can always showcase their military hardware to the world, whether it's stuff that they use on the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, with no accountability from the international community, you know. And we've seen this again and again and again being carried out in various attacks. And they always, you know, uh, the, the, every, uh, somebody said, well, what was... Um, 2008, 2009, the bombings and so on and so forth, but the 2012 attack on Gaza, and I said, did you notice how many times they mentioned the Iron Dome system? 
they mentioned that in every single report, how they had put up an Iron Dome system that was able to deflect any of the rockets that are coming from Hamas. And I'm sure, you know, that came out with, with billions of dollars in contracts. So I think that whole, you know, this, again, this is where um, highlighting these issues and carrying out actions against these issues and confronting these issues becomes really, really um, important. And I don't think we have anything to fear with the amount of money and, and effort that, that Israel is putting towards anti, you know, BDS activism, regardless of the attempts of, you know, taking tenure away from people or not allowing people to have sabbatical or carrying out all of these really uh, personal attacks against any pro-Palestinian activist um, or writing up about organizations or institutions we've all been written up. It's not, it's, it doesn't, there's no fear in it anymore. There's really no fear in doing this type of work anymore. Um, about the academic boycott, I, I think that by far, academic boycott is the hardest type of boycott to carry out. And I think that that's why what NIACT is doing is so important and so essential. Because it's a very difficult thing for people to accept that academic institutions are complicit in violations of international law and military actions and war crimes and so on and so forth. This is beyond, beyond our ability, even though we know that the people that create this technology ultimately do come from these institutions, but the connection is really, really hard. Um, I would say this is why one of the reasons why TIA CREF makes sense on campuses in the US at this time. Because TIA CREF is almost like somebody has said, it's by boycott light. All you're saying to your institution or to people inside your institution is you want to put pressure on another organization, on another institution, which is TIA CREF, to divest from these companies. You're not actually asking your very, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zionist or entrenched campus to kind of divest themselves, which is very scary, and you can't anyway find out what their portfolio is, and it's impossible to get the numbers, and you're not getting people to do a direct, you know, an NYU campus boycott of Israel, but you're saying, we don't want TIA craft complicit in international, you know, violations of international law. So it becomes an easier way of moving forward. Now, I think the other parts become where you raise awareness and information. So there's nothing wrong with carrying out um, discussions on campus about what uh, Technion is doing, or what uh, you know Haifa University is doing, or is it violating international law? And that begins to push the agenda forward, so that almost when you come with the TIA craft proposal, people are like, oh yeah, yeah. If, if you're not pulling for academic boycott or cultural boycott, you know what? Yeah, I'll sign this petition. You have, you know, you have something. You push the dis discourse using that. But I think at this time, the, the U.S. is really, it's not, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do an academic boycott. Yeah, I think it's 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 a good program, or a targeted campaign against a particular com uh, company. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, that's one thing for us. In a way, if you were going to pick an academic institute to focus on from Israel, you'd pick Technion because they're so involved in military development and surveillance. It almost becomes not about academic research or you know philosophical philosophical stuff at all. It's to do with real tangible things that most people would have strong feelings about. And that's where the TCREP campaign as well is also obviously very good and that it has Caterpillar and LB and Northrop Grumman. Um, I, would, I, would just, I would just question a little bit this idea that Israel can get away with things that the United States can't. Um, as a government that's killed millions of people in the Philippines and Vietnam and Iraq that has more wars than we can count going on right at this moment that has used nuclear weapons and openly threatens to. I mean, this was the big uh, applause for Obama's speech at the UN some weeks back. He didn't threaten first strike nuclear attack, uh, and he, but they routinely do, and nobody else does. Israel pretends they don't have them. The United States has used white phosphorus in the Middle East. The United States has used depleted uranium. The United States has, uses cluster bombs, refuses to ban landmines. I mean, I don't, the, the United States protects Israel from the International Criminal Court, but it protects itself too. Um, and the United so, States has used the atomic bomb. Has used right. it, yes, uh, and threatens to, and locks up Muslims and exports them from the country. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know, double tap strikes shooting missiles at the rescuers of the victims of the, the missiles. I, I mean, I don't know 
what I'd like to hear more about what Israel can get away with that the United States can't, because it seems to get away with a lot. Um, and, and I do think Christian Zionists have some influence, but I think uh, it, you know it, it's woven in with APAC's influence and the military industrial complex's influence, and I think every war has a dozen or more clear motivations. We're never going to find the secret one, and I think we should start stop arguing with each other over which is the real one. You know, there, there, there are all these, uh, but they're not invincible. You know, Raytheon's stock was through the roof. The warmongers were cheering. The missiles were about to go, and we said hell no, and stopped them. And Congress members from both parties and both houses said we never had remotely this many emails and phone calls and visits and harassment by you people on anything, any topic. Never was it so one-sided and never was it so passionate. Uh, and, you know, that in combination with the House of Commons saying no to a prime minister for the first time in 200 years and the world's governments and the UN saying no, uh, you know, it, they're not, they're not, Invincible, and I'm I'm very interested in how this these social retirement funds can get at the the U.S. military industrial complex, including Northrop Grumman, because it would be a wonderful new tool for some people. Okay. Do we have any any more responses to the series of questions? Uh, not to questions, but are we doing sort of closing comments? Yes, we are closing okay. comments. So uh, closing comments. No, we we really have to close. It's okay. quite late. Uh, I think, you know, just kind of building on this, uh, two, two points. Recognizing that the powers that be are not invincible. And then the only way to challenge them is to continue to organize, organize, organize. Uh, I think, you know, protests are a very important uh, strategy and a tool, but we have to also do a lot more in addition to protests. I think it's figuring out where the bidding, uh, you know, sort of stuff is happening and, and figuring out how do we interrupt those processes. It's doing the research and figuring out where money is going and, and where are the places, intersections where we can sort of uh, exert pressure and, and have leverage. Uh, and, and we need to commit ourselves to do that type of organizing a lot more uh, because protests by themselves will not be effective, but then those strategies without protests will also not be effective. Uh, so we, we have to recognize that these are not invincible powers, institutions, and uh, just a call to organize. I'd like to follow on from that just because it really chimes with why we held this event as well, which is to do with working together as activists through different you know, focuses that we all have on surveillance on different communities, but we all have so much in common and we need to help each other in order to make a real difference. So that's partly why when we sat down and thought about putting a panel discussion together, we decided to do it this way as opposed to having it all about BDS or all about surveillance. And I think that's something that we should continue to do more of. And we really appreciate you guys for coming.